and I was told to occupy a house that was sort of halfway between our forces and the Germans who were on a hill facing us and to, I had a, t a telephone, and to phone back the news if the Germans were visibly preparing to attack so that my people could get ready for it. And so I, I was there uh, performing this action, actually with a uh, binoculars watching the German line, and all of a sudden I saw some s German soldiers preparing a trench of some kind on the top of this hill. And they were visible only because they had set the town, the city of saint Dier in the Vosges Mountains afire, and because they were silhouetted up there. And so I had heard uh, a few days before that the complaint from a senior officer that junior officers never did anything. They, they just waited for instructions and they did that. They, they didn't initiate anything, so I said, here's my chance. Mm. So I phoned back to the heavy mortars and I said, have I got a target for you? Uh, give me, a, uh, give me a, a, a shell and I will direct the fire. I'll correct where it's going. So they did that and uh, it was an amazingly accurate first shot. And I said, move it 200 yards to the right and uh, fire for effect, which means fire to kill. <coughs> and the next one, I think, dropped right into this hole that these guys were building because all sorts of bodies flew up in the air to my immense gratitude. I had done something to help win the war. And <coughs> in the house, I was on the top floor of this house, uh, feeling full of self-congratulation. I went down to the kitchen to see if I could get something to eat. And the family was in the, still in the house, the French family, and they were in the cellar, except for their daughter who was cooking or something. And uh, the minute I was downstairs, the whole top floor exploded because they had fired an 88 shell exactly where I had been. They had been seeing me all the time with these idiot glasses. Mm -hmm and had been planning some sort of amusing denouement to the situation. Mm. And <clears throat> one of the, uh, the, the shell actually missed me, but the fr a fragment hit the daughter of this house in her leg and uh, infuriated her father. We had to pacify him for the whole night as we hid in his cellar. But that was an appalling close call. And as the war went on, I had had so many experiences like that that I actually began to believe in God, mm. you know, which for me is a very rare thing to do. And I thought, somebody is saving me for some, some other operation than this performance. Because uh, the, the day I rescued uh, Lieutenant Goldman, nobody had shot at me, and they, they should have, and so forth. And bullets would miss me, and uh, artillery shells would go off near me without damage and so on. So I began to believe that I was somehow uh, special until, <laughs> until I was finally hit yeah. by an artillery shell. Yeah, yeah. Tell what happened, uh, Paul, uh, when uh, you were leading a patrol and everybody else went off in different directions to look for Germans and, to my amazement, left their rifles behind and then you saw oh, a German God, patrol. Oh, God, yes. Incredible. My fault because <coughs> they had left the rifles behind, which one never does. I should have noticed and corrected them. The rifles were all leaning up against a very large tree. And uh, my platoon sergeant had taken a group of them off to help do the mission, the part of the mission he was responsible for. And so I saw him across the way, about 100 yards away. And to make certain he recognized me, because there were Germans all over the place, I waved merrily at him. And the person I was waving at looked to one of the members of his group. There were three or four of them. I, instantly, I saw that he was not wearing an American helmet. He was wearing a German helmet, which was cut out square on the side. And there I was utterly unarmed because I had foolishly leaned my rifle up against the tree. So I grabbed somebody else's rifle, put it on my shoulder. At the time, this uh, German was beginning to catch on that something was happening here. His rifle was slung on his shoulder, but he was get, trying to get it off. I knelt down and grabbed this rifle, this M1 rifle, a magnificent instrument, by the way, 
uh, opened up the, uh, the lock on it and kneeling, fired eight shots at that group of Germans, killing one, injuring another whom we caught later and causing another to run right into my group of people. So we, we brought him back as a prisoner. But that was a very, very close call. If he had noticed me first, I would have been killed. Yeah, yeah. Well, that took a little, that, that, that took uh, so much out of me that I remember one of my sergeants after said, uh, just take it easy, Lieutenant. Take it easy. <laughs> I wasn't trembling, but practically, you know. Yeah, yeah. I was very, very scared. Yeah, I understand. You, that's where you developed the idea of Got the idea celerity ought to be added to duty on our country. Yeah. Because celerity makes all the difference. That's right. Being fast it used to be one of uh, General uh, Patton's very simple rules for surviving yeah. be faster than other people. Yeah. This excerpt is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law, the leader of reform in legal education and a leader in multimedia education for the public. To view the full interview and for a full listing of MSL's programs, log on to mslaw.edu.